So I'm back at the lovely gardens of Fenton House and wanted to offer a reflection or two following my conversation with David Wengro yesterday, the co-author of The Dawn of Everything with David Graeber. I think it's a really important book, but I have critiques of it and it was interesting to put those to David Wengro and see what he made of them. The book's important because what it does is attack the Harari Pinker axis, you might say, the accounts of human history that on the one hand follow the pattern picked up by Noah Yeovil Harari, which essentially argues that we lived in a state of egalitarian happiness until the agricultural revolution undid us. It's a story from Easton to Fall, you might say. And at the other end of this axis is the Stephen Pinker account, which says that in a state of nature we were in a state of war of all against all, and that it's civilization that's tamed our violent instincts, and so we must cling on to civilization in the way that it pins us down at all costs. It, you might say, is the opposite of from Eden to fall from violence, the Hobbesian image, to being tamed by the Leviathan of the modern age. Now, David Wengrove and David Graeber undo this by showing that the history, the prehistory, doesn't support it. There's always been multiple ways of organising life. And they, in a way, introduce a new state of nature for we humans, which is that we're free we're free to move, we're free to disobey, and we're free to reorganise. It draws quite a lot from certainly David Graeber's anarchist philosophy. And that was one of the critiques that I put to David Wengro. How about this freedom? Isn't it just a new universal story that no doubt could be undone by different kinds of evidence? And his reply was interesting. He said that different social organisations have enabled different kinds of freedom to be exercised. And that was interesting to me because I thought he might say that in earlier moments of history, and certainly in prehistory, there was just space in the environment to be free because it wasn't governed by human organisation, it wasn't shaped by the rituals of humanity. And so there was always space to move into a new place and reorganise. That was the nature of the freedom of our ancestors. But he's saying that something different than that, that no, that there were patterns of organisation that had freedom baked into them, particularly the freedom to move to new lands or the freedom to overturn rulers or the freedom to reorganise in different ways. And so that was a first thought to me that made me question that this account of freedom again. I wondered whether this sense of freedom is not modern in itself. And that led to my second bigger critique really, which is that in their book, I felt there was little account room for what I call the spiritual commons the sense of connecting with a whole ecology of vitalities, beings, spiritual and natural, that I think, I suspect, that most humans, for most of human history, related to in the richness of their lives, through ritual, through worship, through sacrifice, through festivals, through the great cycles that, I suspect, shaped a very significant proportion of their lives. Their lives weren't just governed by economic production, weren't even governed by political organisation, but were governed by these patterns of life, these dynamics and forces that they knew and felt to be around them, the spiritual commons. And David Wengrove recognised this and said that in their book, there was space for the spiritual commons, but interestingly to me, he funneled that through the question of power. He said that some 
cultures, times and places clearly had addressed the question of power through the spiritual, for example, rituals that might relativise the power of a king or festivals that might question the power that otherwise would just fall to those in charge. And again, I thought this was interesting because I recognise what he's saying, but it feels to me like the spiritual commons is again being forced through quite a secular material sieve, namely the sieve of power. Power is the real issue, you might say, and it felt like his remark could be interpreted as the spiritual commons are really a, a proxy for the ex exercise of power. Now, I'm not so keen on this because it feels to me like it's suggesting that maybe one would grow out of that particular proxy, the spiritual commons, recognising that it's some sort of delusion. I don't think that's the case at all. But also, I was wary of it because I think that it assumes there's really only one type of power, which is the power of exercising your own agency, and not a different kind of power, which is the power of other life, the power of beauty to draw you, the power of love to relate, the power of truth to know more and find your resting place in that, which we human beings seem to have in a particularly distinctive way with our consciousness and self-consciousness. That feels to me like the power that reaches towards us, not just the power we exercise ourselves. The power of grace, you might say, as well as the power of agency. So that's something of what we discussed. I hope it might be an ongoing conversation. I talked to David after the formal interview and he was open to a lot of this, I think. And so if it seems a little unfair, me posting my thoughts without him able to make a response again, I hope we might have that further conversation. He even knew of Owen Barfield, which those of you who listen to what I post regularly will know is a good marker for me.